Okay, uh, good morning, directors, staff, guests, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Jake Martins, and as the Deputy Corporate Legislative Officer, I will be calling this meeting to order and starting the meeting by first recognizing that we are conducting our business today on the traditional mm -hmm. unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. In accordance with the CVRD procedure bylaw and the terms of reference for the Electoral Area Services Committee, the first order of business today is the election of the Chair and Vice Chair for 2022. I will begin the process by calling for nominations for the position of chair. Any director may put forward another director's name, and I will call for nominations three times. And at the close of nominations, I will ask each nominee if they will let their name stand for election. If more than one director is nominated, each candidate will have three minutes to make a campaign presentation. Following the speeches, I will ask that you either print the last name of your selection for chair on the colored ballot in front of you using a pen, or alternatively, if you're participating electronically, you can complete the poll or send me a text uh, to indicate your vote. The ballots will be collected by Russell Dyson and myself, who will count the ballots and then we'll announce the results. The process for the election of vice chair is the same as I've just described. However, candidates will be allowed just two minutes for their speech following the elections that will ask for a resolution to destroy any ballots that are created. Are there any questions from the directors? And I will just advise that uh, in the room here today, we have Director Daniel Barber, Director Edwin Green. And yeah. participating online is uh, Director Arzina. Maybe one of those. Thank you. If I could just ask everyone to mute their microphones here just at this moment. Thank you. So with that, directors, are there any questions before we begin the process? Seeing and hearing none, uh, then I will accept any nominations for the position of chair. Director Grief. Yes, thank you. I would like to nominate Director Arbor for Chair of the Electricity Services Committee. Thank you. Thank you. I will call a second time for any nominations of Chair. And I uh, hope oh, Director Arbor. Very much appreciate Director Grieve, uh, and uh, and I I, um, I think for this time I will I will decline uh, just thinking on it, and I would like to uh, nominate uh, Director Hamir if she has your support as well. Okay, thank you, Director Arbor. I will call a third time now for the position of chair. Hearing and seeing none, Director Hamir, do you allow your name to stand for the position of chair? I do, thank you. Thank you, then I'm pleased to announce you as chair for the Electoral Area Services Committee for 2022. Thank you, and thanks and, to my uh, fellow directors. We, thanks. And we will now start the same process for vice chair for 2022, uh, and uh, we'll open the floor for nominations. I'd like to nominate Dr. Grief for vice chair. Okay, I will call a second time. Any other nominations for vice chair? And a third and final time. And Director Grieve, do you allow your name to stand for vice chair? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in our little three member committee, it's pretty slim pickings. It's nice to spread it around. And I was hoping that uh, Director Arbor would take it on because traditionally we rotate this chair. Thank you. Thanks, and I am pleased to announce Dr. Grieve as Vice Chair for the ASC for 2022. As there's no ballots, we don't require a resolution here to destroy any of the ballots. And uh, with that, I'm pleased to turn uh, the chair over to uh, Chair Hamir. Thanks so very much, Jake, and thanks to my fellow directors. And um, um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, happy, happy New Year to everybody in the room and online. And um, this is our final term as uh, elected officials, um, especially in the, in the regional district. And, and I know we have a lot of work to do and, and uh, we've got lots that we want to accomplish this year. So I look forward to working collaboratively with, with my directors and with staff and um, in order to serve uh, the Valley as effectively as we can. Having said that, I want to recognize that we are meeting on the unceded and traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. 
with whose government uh, we as a regional district have committed to working on, on a government to government relation. And we thank the elders of the community for stewarding this land since time immemorial. Uh, I want to recognize we have a deleg delegation coming today, the concerned citizens of Union Bay, uh, Ray Newcastle, Robert Kerr and Marilyn Manon uh, to present their concerns. So I will switch it over to the delegation. Um, you have 10 minutes for Hello, your- Hello, Gracie. Thank you. And we have a second, just- Director Arbor seconded. Great, thank you. Apologies not to not hear that. And um, sorry, I will move it over to the delegation now. Okay, can we sh screen share? Yep, go ahead, Ray. Three yeah. options. That's that one. Stop. No. Just trying to bring ours up on the on the screen. Oh, oh here we go. Do you have control of the? Are you in control, or do we have control? You should be able to screen share, Ray. But if you're having problems, I can pull it up from my end. Okay, I think we got it. Oh. Yeah, I think we got it. Here we go. Okay, go back. All right, so good morning. Uh, my name is Ray Rucastle, and I'm presenting on behalf of the Concerned Citizens of Bain Sound. And we'll welcome questions at the end of this presentation. Uh, who Ray, we are- sorry, Before you go ahead, I don't see a presentation, so uh, it's not shared. It's not sharing. Maybe we can ask our staff to bring that up. Great, I see it now. And you can just indicate to staff when you want the um, the next slide up. Okay, do we have control? Or... I think we have control. Okay, we, yeah, we've got control now. Um, so who we are, uh, we'd like to first acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. We are here today as a voice for not only ourselves, but for those who cannot speak for fear and for those who do not have a voice, our environment, our fisheries, our wildlife and our children. We are residents and families of Union Bay, the adjacent neighborhood and the Comox Valley. We are a team comprised of a science teacher, retirees, artists, healthcare workers, college professor, marine and wildlife biologists, a project director for international engineering and construction companies, a forensic auditor, HSC management, a regulatory compliance manager, business managers, business owners, and an international organization, NGO. Collectively, we have over 120 years of expertise in heavy industrial construction, regulatory compliance in the oil and gas, mining, power, petrochemical, and pulp and paper industries in Canada and the US. We are problem solvers. In, in, our, in our process to, to develop our-, Ray, our the, the PowerPoint isn't moving. It's not? No. So, uh, so we have control over here, at, I believe. So Ray, just when you're ready for the next slide, just say next slide. Okay, thanks Daniel. All right, so we, uh, we've partnered with NGO Shipbreaking Platform. Um, they're out of Bru Brussels, Belgium. They're a, they're a coalition of 17 environmental, human and labor rights organizations globally. For more than 10 years as the world's leading organization campaigning for clean and safe ship recycling. It has been fighting for shipbreaking workers' rights for a safe job, the use of best available technologies, and for equally protective environment standards globally. More than 100 non-governmental organizations around the world, the European Union and the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics, and major shipping banks and investors have voiced their support to the platform's objective to end dangerous and polluting shipbreaking practices. They have successfully pushed for a new European law that aims to divert an increasing number of ship owners towards safe and clean ship recycling and sets a standard that bans beaching and demands environmentally sound management of wastes downstream and decent working conditions. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. We they are in the uh, process right now. We are they are sending a letter of concern to the federal and provincial governments of Canada at the highest levels uh, to voice their their support of us. Next. Next slide. Thank you. So shipbreaking is globally known as one of the most dangerous and hazardous industries. It is a process of dismantling an obsolete vessel structure for scrapping or disposal conducted at a dry dock. It includes a wide range of activities from removing all gear and equipment to cutting down and recycling the ship's infrastructure. Shipbreaking is a challenging process due to the structural and complexity of the ships and the many environmental safety and health issues involved. This here, this picture is a cross section of a, of a typical ship and it shows all of the toxins and contaminants that can be part of that, uh, that hull. PCBs, lead paint, asbestos. The um, Canada has no specific regulations for shipbreaking, unlike the United States that has federal standards and regulations. Because of the global problem associated with shipbreaking, the EUE put in place rules and accreditations to approve compliant shipbreaking. To date, there is only one approved EU accredited facility and that's in Bowmanville, Texas within the United States. When contacted, they were quite surprised that we would be allowing a operation like this to, to be in place on the west coast of British Columbia. Next. Uh, the hazards and effects of shipbreaking. There's the human costs, death, disease from asbestos, hydrocarbon residues, PCBs, all from inhalation, thermal absorption through the skin and flash ignition. In Vancouver in the lower mainland in 2018, there was a at a shipwrecking facility, a fire resulted from a cutting torch that ignited insulation between the walls of the vessel. The Vancouver Fire Department had to respond. And the Miller Freeman that we see sitting out in the water in Union Bay, that had a fire on it while it was sitting in the Seattle shipyards waiting for scrapping. And the Seattle Fire Department had to respond to put that out. And boom, so on the environmental costs, you know, hydrocarbon residues and other contaminants and toxins from ships are spilled and mixed with water on the land and foreshore, causing widespread pollution in the marine environment and threatening the life of coastal and marine biodiversity. A boom and catch basin at the bottom of a slope is not a responsible way of containing runoff. From the time it lands on the ground to the time it gets down to the to the sump, it has all opportunity to leach into the ground through cracks in the concrete, through the soils and, and so forth. The, also the problem is all of the, on the barges, it, they've been shipping hydrocarbons and chemicals for 30, 40 years. Over those years, those chemicals and hydrocarbons impregnate themselves and leach into the steel. So when you're cutting up the steel at a later date, there could be many fumes and a source of ignition. Shipbreaking is considered hazardous waste. Canada's Marytown, Newfoundland, they started shipbreaking back in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And by the time the government realized how much damage it was being done and shut them down, to this day, they are still suffering the effects of occupational disease and deaths due to that uh, shipyard. As Chess Crosby, a lawyer from Newf Newfoundland, human cost of shipbreaking is still being felt today, three decades later. Next. The World Wildlife Federation of Canada in May 2019 report toward integrated management in Bain Sound. The marine region is a source of significant ecological productivity as well as economic activity. It is the highest ranked cumulative and spawning area for herring in the Strait of Georgia and is a critical feeding area and overwintering area for water birds. Bain Sound also supports the highest density of intertidal shellfish aquaculture in British Columbia, producing over half of the shellfish cultured in the province. And it's located on the traditional territories of several First Nations, including our Comox First Nation, who are also opposed to this operation. It is recognized as an ecologically and biologically significant area by the federal government that calls for enhanced management. There are numerous salmon bearing streams that enter the sound and provide pathways for migration. Within a kilometer of the shipbreaking operation, there are 100 species of birds, of which seven are listed at risk. Next, please. So what we see here is the right and the wrong way of shipbreaking. On the, on the left is the Marco Polo Green Ship Recycling Facility in Indonesia. It is globally certified and awarded an ISO certificate, which is recognized by the shipping industry for compliance with the new European Union regulation on ship recycling. 
As you can see, it's 100% containment in dry docks. It's all concrete berms. There are sumps, there are containment uh, vessels inside the, inside the dry dock, heavy lift cranes to safely remove the, the steel that's being cut. And that is, that is what, is, what is an NGO are trying to establish worldwide. That is also what you'll see down in Bowmansville, Texas. And then we have on the right, the wrong way of doing it. This is looking east. This is the Union Bay facility. And as you can see to the, to the right, there's, there's a home and homes. And in that home, there's a young family with two small children. There are seven children on that street and numerous grandchildren. To the west, across the highway, there are residences. And to the left, um, to the south, there's the Union Bay Estates that is starting to grow and is a multi-million dollar residential uh, community that's gonna be coming up. On here, what you're seeing is you're seeing beaching of vessels. Even though we call it the foreshore, it's still beaching. And that is what perked the NGO's interest. They are trying to stop that worldwide. So the vessels are pulled up onto the shore, over the beach and foreshore, onto the land. And as you can see here, the, uh, the, the barge that's to the, to the right of the left one, that's being cut up on the foreshore, which is in violation of the, of the FLNR foreshore lease. This is a picture from November before the Queen of Burnaby uh, showed up. Also the Miller Freeman, the ship on the, on the left, the upper decks have been broken down um, more to this date. And again, that's not allowed per the per DFO or FLNR breaking of ships on the water. And as you can see, it's a mess. I mean, there's, there's, there's steel everywhere. There's the land. You can also see to the left that they've gone and they've excavated a large section of land. And the question we have is, was that, was that allowed per the CVRD bylaws as well as the FLNR foreshore lease? It's the wrong way of doing it. Next, please. So the responses from the governing agency, agencies. Out of our area responsibilities, the high tide mark. Uh, no, we only look at the low tide mark. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction. Uh, we're accountable for the land, not the foreshore. In the KFN press release said that they are voicing their concerns with CVRD, provincial and federal governments for 18 months. We have been doing the same for over a year. Next. And this is a disaster waiting to happen. So our expectations, KFN's ob ob objection along with the residents of Comox Valley to shipbreaking in Bain Sound cries out for leadership by all levels of government. There's no safe way to conduct shipbreaking in Bay Sound. After reviewing, NGO shipbreaking platform agreed that this shipbreaking operation on Bain Sound must be shut down. We encourage the CVRD to reach out to the province, attorney general, the federal government to utilize their resources and expertise. The operator of this site appears to be well-funded and aggressive, necessitating the CVRD to strengthen their expertise with all available resources. Next. CVRD to issue an immediate cease and desist order to UBIL DWRL for all operations at their shipbreaking site in Union Bay. The FLNR to issue an immediate cease and desist order to UBIL DWRL for non-compliance activities on the foreshore. Ensure that UBIL DWRL send all vessels to an accredited shipbreaking site at an existing heavy industrial deep water marine port. Ensure that UBIL DWRL are accountable to remove all remnants of the shipbreaking operation and remediate the hazardous waste site. Federal and provincial government agencies should work together to determine best practices for shipbreaking. Next. So questions we have for the CVRD. What was said to the FLNR, which approved the water lease? Their comment to us was that the CV, through consultation with the CVRD, we approved the lease. Does the Union Bay Volunteer Fire Department have the appropriate resources to respond to a hazardous spill, chemical fire, or catastrophic event? As noted earlier, both Vancouver fire departments and Seattle fire departments are fully geared up and trained to take care of industrial hazards. What is being done about the creek diversion? The creek diversion was completed by UBIL DWRL without required assessment and a development permit. What is the path forward? DWRL has been operating in non-compliance to the CVRD zoning bylaws. This has been stated by CVRD employees. How long are you gonna allow this hazardous waste operation to continue? What has and is the CVR doing on a regular basis to monitor and ensure that public safety and the environment are being protected while DWRL operates in non-compliance? If so, 
provide logs and meeting minutes? And why are we continuing to jeopardize Bain Sound and the health of our constituents? One other question is that in January of last year, I believe there was a site tour on the site. We would like to know who those individuals were on the site tour and what the outcome of the tour was. So as concerned citizens of Bain Sound and all credible environmental studies do not support shipbreaking in Bain Sound. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, you've posed a lot of questions. So I'm actually gonna ask our directors first um, if they have questions of you um, and if staff can just let me know who's, who's first on the, if, if, if lights go on. Great, Director Grief. Thank you. I would uh, I would like to hear from staff on this first, if we could. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Grief. I'll refer to Elena Malawi, and we also have Amanda Yasinski, who is on the, on the line. Amanda is uh, our uh, manager of bylaw compliance, and Alana is our general manager of planning and development. Thanks, Alana. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chair Hamir. Through Chair Hamir to the directors uh, and to the delegation, thank you for your presentation. Um, as the directors are aware, staff is working with the agent for deep water uh, Union Bay industry uh, to resolve the non-compliance issue on the property. And we have been working with the agent for many months now. Okay, well, it, to, to us, that's a non-starter. But. Sorry, Ray. I think um, I think we are, as directors, are the only ones to be able to oh. ask staff questions. Um, but you know, we'll try and. Uh, you did raise a number of questions in your presentation, so we'll try and address those to you. Um, Director Grieve, did you have any further question of staff? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So um, it was stated that they've been working with the. Uh, the agent of the of the, uh, the company, and uh, so is is the company located uh, in Canada or is it a foreign co company? Uh, through the chair to the directors, uh, the agent is is um, represent has been assigned by the company to be their agent, and that uh, person is operating. We understand out of the United States with a Union Bay post office uh, address. A Union Bay post office. Mm -hmm. Makes him an honorary Canadian citizen, I guess. Okay, so uh, we're dealing with a, a, a foreign company that has no ties in the community. Um, we've been dealing in good faith for a number of months already, and there's no progress. And it looks like uh, the senior government are just playing footsies all the way on this one and kicking it back down to the lowest level of government, which is, of course, us. But it seems astounding to me that, unlike Courtney, uh, Union Bay actually has a uh, an MLA who's a cabinet minister as well. So I'm just wondering, uh, has there been any communication with the uh, the province on this? Um, um, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, I can answer the question just to say that uh, the MLA for the area, Josie Osborne, is the Minister of Municipal Affairs. and. Uh, her constituent office has provided response to some of the citizens that have posed questions and uh, those those answers have been copied to us. So I guess in answer to your question, the MLA is involved and is, is has been sharing information and is knowledgeable of the concerns and the issues. Thanks, Director Grieve. Director Arbor, oh, did you? Okay, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, my uh, my colleague. Go ahead, Danny. Thank you. I um, I did have two meetings with um, MLA Josie Osborne over the last four months, um, in which we uh, we discuss not in just in this particular case, but in cases in general, the need for much better collaboration across the silos of government. And uh, and actually, tomorrow you'll see uh, that the board. Um, some support to KFN in trying to work towards that in the long term for Bain Sound. Um, I, I think the the questions that are being raised are valid. I uh, 
on their staff answers them today. And when I say the questions, the questions in the presentation, there's a, a good list. Maybe staff is not prepared to answer those today, but um, maybe under new business or whatever, I would like to propose that we ask staff to respond to each of those questions um, and including one that was not on the list, which is um, about the tour, which I partook in, I think it was January 13th last year. Um, and um, yeah, I think from there, it's it's a matter of, um, of of understanding that sometimes the 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 wheels of um, government work slowly. Uh, we've been involved in in bylaw cases where it wasn't quite measured in decades how long it took to resolve them, but Director Grieve would have the experience of them of that. Um, so I think there's there's a sentiment out there that uh, government can do better. Uh, in terms of um, one question I have for staff is obviously we have discussed before Christmas that one of the ways we're working with the applicant or the, uh, the operator is to look at a temporary use permit or a rezoning process. I would love it if um, staff today could describe what those two processes look like and what level of public engagement exists. To Madam Chair, to the directors. So when we have a use that doesn't comply, we suggest to individuals that they can do a couple of things, three things really. They can either stop the use and find a use that is supported under the zoning. They can make an application through this committee to the board to amend our rural zoning bylaw to a zone that would enable the use or to, or to create a zone that would enable the use. And the third option we present to folks is the um, obtaining a temporary use permit. I'll start with that one. A temporary use permit is a tool enabled uh, for use by local governments when a use is not permitted in a zone and the local government wants to either test the use. These are the, these are the common reasons for using. Test the use to see if it's appropriate, if it, if it complies uh, with what's going on in the area, if, it's, if it can be accommodated in the area. Or another common uh, use of that tool is when a, a, an owner of a property seeks to undertake a use for just a short period, an interim, for example. So that's one tool. This temporary use permit is a permit that is issued by approval of the board to an owner of the property. It is not transferable. It is very specific. The board can assign terms and conditions and can put a time limit on the temporary use permit. Local Government Act tells us that the temporary use permit can be issued for a period of up to three years with an opportunity for a one-time renewal of an additional up to three years. So very much in the hands of the decision maker being the board to set those terms and conditions and to um, do some things that we can't do through the zoning tool. And this board is familiar with temporary use permit for the public. Uh, we have, the board has issued temporary use permits in some other instances uh, within the electoral areas. Zoning bylaw is a little bit more familiar, I think, to folks uh, in the community that you see uh, public notice. And this is sort of to your piece, Director Arbor, I would suggest that the zoning bylaw amendment process provides more opportunities for involvement of the community. So we provide notice uh, uh, in the newspaper, we provide it on our website. But then the other thing that the Local Government Act requires of zoning, and this is different from temporary use permit, in a zoning bylaw amendment, there is a requirement for a public hearing. So, so that's sort of the short stop. What I would wanna say though, is that over the years, we've learned a lot about how our community wants to engage and how they want to be involved and how we want to involve them to ensure that we can have uh, good relations and people understand uh, what's happening in their community in respect to land use. So a number of years ago, we came to you, we came to your predecessors with a policy around how we would undertake temporary use permits. And one of the pieces that we acknowledged there was that there is an interest above and beyond what the Local Government Act might say for the public to know about these. And so while we don't have a statutory public hearing, we always reserve the right for the board to identify their interest in hosting a public information meeting. That's always your prerogative once we have an application. Um, and then we also do provide notice of the meeting where a decision is going to be made. And so members of the community could come to that meeting, that would be a board meeting, could come to that meeting, could register to speak as a delegation and provide you with their feedback. So although it is, is different under the statute, we do recognize the interest of our community in providing your feedback to you. Thank you. 
just a quick follow up, if I can, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you for that explanation. And uh, maybe uh, I was reviewing the temporary use permit, the, the bylaw we have for it. Um, so is it fair to say that um, it, it goes to the advisory planning commission and the EASC and the board, but there may not be a referral process to other organizations or KFN or the community, whereas the zoning amendment would have, would have all those components. Uh, through the chair to the directors, part of that uh, recognition a number of years ago in, in the interest uh, in the temporary use permit in the engagement, we also included a referral. Because for us very often with these uses that are either, for example, a use that's being tested, we need feedback from those who have expertise in the area or an intimate understanding of a property, for example, that we might not have. So under the te temporary use permit process, we similarly incorporate a referral, and most certainly we would be consulting with KFN and uh, other uh, First Nations in our area. Thanks, Alana. Um, just a couple of questions that I had, because I, I know in, that the delegation asked a, a, a few questions be answered. Can you confirm that uh, on the non-compliance question and whether or not we have received any kind of um, formal request versus uh, um, temporary use permit or zoning application? Um, through Chair Hamir to the directors, um, it's staff's interpretation that we have a non-compliant use in the industrial marine zone. And so we have written to the agent requesting that they advise what their plan is to do. I'll bring you back to those three options that I said that it's our, it's our mm -hmm. common practice. When we have this situation, we work with folks to say either, you know, let us know if you're going to stop the use and find a, a use that complies, or if you're going to make an application, uh, either for those two pieces, rezoning or temporary use permit. And in this instance, we've not yet heard back. We're still within that frame of time that we've allotted uh, the owner and the agent to give us that indication. Uh, and we will come back to uh, Electoral Area Services Committee. Great, thank you. Do directors have any other questions? Yes, Go I ahead. do. Go ahead, Director Reed. Okay, a very wise former mayor of Comox told me whatever the issue, Ed, all you have to do is follow the money. So the question is, Who's benefiting from this operation? Are there any permits or licensing fees? And if so, who are they payable to? Uh, through the chair to the directors. So the, um, as you know, there was an application by the agent to amend the water lease. Uh, pardon me, the license, the water license with the province. And so that process has unfolded and the amendment to that license was issued in October of 2021. I can't speak to process or application fees that the ministry uh, has, but certainly we could come back to you after getting that information from Flynn Rose staff. At our end, certainly an application is made. We've got a public procedures and fees bylaw that outlines our fees schedule. And as you'll know, under the Local Government Act, we collect fees in an effort to recover the cost of staff time and your time in processing those applications. That's what fees look like here. Yeah, at this uh, order of government, not level of government. Um, so I'm just thinking uh, when we're talking about fees at the, uh, the, the Coma, Momos Valley really Regional District level, um, they're pretty, pretty minimal. But um, obviously, uh, somebody's making some big money here, and the money's going somewhere. So I'm just wondering if we can maybe get that into the report, find out what the province does get for this. And I don't hold much hope for the federal or provincial governments, because they've already had a quick elections, and they're pretty well sitting pretty for another four years. So we're not going to get much action, but I do think that it should all come to light. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, just like uh, when it comes to the big money and fees, I would just like to distinguish the fees that local government charges to their citizens and landowners, as well as for the most part, the province are highly regulated. And in, in, I can speak uh, very definitively to the fees of local government. We cannot charge fees that do not pay the costs of the processing of the applications for which we're providing. There's no extra money. And there are similar standards that apply for the fees of, of the province. So in terms of 
following the money. There's not a lot of money to follow when we look at fees. I, I'm not sure about the the, um, the 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 whether that covers your question or not, uh, uh, Director Green. But uh, certainly the 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 um, the delegation today has provided some very well searched, very good information, and we very much appreciate and respect that the amount of time and effort they provided to us. They've asked us some questions here, which we can't necessarily answer for you today, but certainly a, a resolution to direct staff to come back with a report that responds to those, those questions uh, it is something that staff can follow through on if, if that's your desire. Thanks, Russell. Um, any further questions from me? Daniel, go ahead. Just one last comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I think maybe under new business would be appropriate to ask for a, a little report on these questions. Um, so that will be later in, in our agenda. Um, I do want to go back to the delega delegation because we haven't engaged with them for a few minutes now. But uh, I do want to say that, I, I, as our CEO says, I do appreciate the work uh, that they've done. Um, I know that some people in Union Bay uh, may not appreciate um, consideration of temporary use permit or rezoning, but as elected officials, we have a duty to impartiality and always leave a door open that this uh, could potentially be a good enterprise and could meet all the different standards that you spoke of, or at least to present their case. And I guess that's what's uh, been missing in the equation here is that we haven't seen uh, you know, a case presented that we can actually uh, comment on uh, in, in a more substantive manner. All we have is, is the evidence of, uh, of what's happened so far, which doesn't seem to, to comply with our bylaws. Uh, so I, I I did want to thank the group for, uh, as the CEO said, a, a well researched, well presented um, uh, show of concern around this issue, and uh, I'll return it to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to echo that. Thank you so much to Ray, to Marilyn, and to Robert for all of the research that you've done on behalf of the community and and reaching out to both local and international groups um, to research what you've done. Um, you've given our staff a lot of information and a lot of questions, and, and it sounds like we will be asking them to come back with a report. So again, thank you for that. So on receipt, um, I'll call the question, anyone opposed to receiving the delegation? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved. Thank you to all three of you. The next item up um, is our management report for receipt. Moved and seconded by Director Wait. Brief and Director Arbor. Thank you. And any questions or comments on that management report? Seeing no lights on, is anyone opposed to receiving? And that is carried. All right, and we'll head on to the reports and then under new business, we'll, we'll consider that motion that uh, Director Arbor had alluded to. So the next item is the update on the extension of sewer services to the South, uh, report for, of January 7th for receipt. Move, move receipt, Arbor. Moved and seconded by myself or Director Brief and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Darian Monteith is online. Darian is our Manager of Liquid Waste Management Planning. She will present a report here. She's supported by a number of our staff that have assisted in the development of the background information for you today, and we're available to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell. Welcome. And, uh, thank you. So through the Chair, uh, as the committee is aware, the CDRD in partnership with KFN is working towards a plan for providing wastewater service to Royston and Union Bay that would connect these communities to the Comox Valley sewer service. In November and early December of 2021, public outreach was undertaken to collect initial feedback on this plan and identify community questions and concerns. And a summary report of this engagement is attached as Appendix A to the staff report. Uh, these engagement sessions were well attended and themes of the feedback were largely in support of the proposed plan, but dependent on additional information before a decision could be made. And cost really does continue to be a primary concern of area residents. Uh, because project costs are high, senior government funding is needed to increase project affordability. So today staff are requesting approval to submit a funding application for the project under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program Environmental Quality Stream, which has an application deadline of January 26th. Uh, total project costs, including 
wastewater collection infrastructure to service the core areas of Royston, Union Bay, and the Kilmarnock neighborhood are high and are above available funding limits. So project implement implementation will therefore also rely on partner contributions and borrowing in order to deliver a cost effective project that the community can support. And staff continue to collaborate with our project partners to explore these cost sharing opportunities. Uh, because of high costs, it's unlikely that all of the electoral area A collection system infrastructure can be included in the grant application scope for the first phase of the project. Therefore, focus will remain on the Union Bay area as it's the area with the most urgent need. But we're also trying to maximize servicing to other areas while balancing resident costs, grant amount limits and partner contribution limits. The delivery of phase one will benefit all existing residents in Royston and Union Bay by providing the, the core infrastructure, the conveyance pipe for all areas to connect into, therefore reducing future servicing costs through the delivery of this key infrastructure. Um, community assent will be required to borrow the funds needed to complete the phase one project and a public engagement strategy is being developed to keep the community informed of the project progress and prepare them for an ascent process in 2022. And grant approval will be contingent on a positive result of this process. So staff will seek to provide the community with as much information as possible about costs, project boundaries, timelines, and design factors as information becomes available over the coming months and community feedback will be considered as we progress with project planning and design. And um, with that, I, I welcome any questions on the report. Thanks so much, Derry. And I just wanna note um, what a great turnout there was on to the, the public engagement. So thanks to our staff for all of that and for everyone who made their voices um, heard. And Director Arbor. Yeah, thank you um, for the update and presentation. I, I have to say that uh, back in October, uh, when we started talking about that, doing that public engagement in November, I guess I was one of the skeptic that uh, we could pull it off in such a short amount of time. But I think staff demonstrated uh, that they were both able to organize all the materials and also uh, entice a really good turnout at both sessions. So I really want to give kudos to staff for that. And uh, the feedback I got in Union Bay um, was really good about both sessions. Um, this is a complicated historical project. Um, and I think we've made great strides the last three years around trying to advance towards it. Um, there's no doubt <clears throat> that um, today's report kind of set me back a little bit again. <laughs> And um, and I, I want to I want to ask some questions uh, just to get confirmation because I'm pretty sure those those questions are going to come up in the community. So we're looking at uh, the area. Uh, didn't talk about the number, but uh, for Royston and Union Bay, I think what was in the report was something like sixty five million dollars. Uh, so we know costs are up in construction. We know you know everyone knows that, and we know that uh, those types of projects are are no no different. Um, at FCM in November, when I was in Ottawa, between uh, when we had an opportunity and a window between uh, Delta and Omicron, uh, that was great to travel there. And I met Scott Pierce, who's the uh, the second uh, vice president for FCM, and he's the the mayor of a small town called Gore. And um, he's he's um, He's been on this uh, this mission to try to entice uh, provincial and federal governments to look at subsidies to individual homeowners for individual septics. And at the time we had a good discussion, he described to me what he was trying to do and how he was running into all kinds of obstacles. I will have a question about that, whether staff can confirm that there are no grants available to update individual septics, uh, either provincially or federally. The reason why I mentioned this is I was quick, qu quickly calculating that, you know, if we're looking at about a thousand properties in Royston and Union Bay, and the cost of a septic uh, system is 30,000, you know, you're looking at 30 million. <laughs> and we have a number to connect everybody to the grid that's 65 million. So twice that amount. The economics are tough on, in terms of uh, infrastructure, even though the, uh, the project is still right and correct. 
there's no doubt that we won't be able to realize this project without grants that screams this. And it's great that we have opportunities for grants that I think deliver up to 70% grant funding. So obviously we would not be able to consider it. And, and I think we'll need to be clear to, uh, to residents in Indian Bay and Westons that we would probably have to park this project for <laughs> the, next, the next long term if we were not successful in getting grants. Um, so, I'm, I, so I just want um, that, that little question around, you know, whether Derry or the, the rest of the team are available of any grant programs for updating individual septics. Um, Madam Chair, I can respond to that and to say that we have no knowledge of any um, grant programs that provide assistance to homeowners to update their septic systems. And while the math may look relatively good, as you've, you've indicated, if that were the program that we instituted and those monies were available, please bear in mind that this solution is also providing for servicing to KFN and Union Bay Estates. Individual septic systems would not provide for those communities. And then the other thing is, is that there are some lots that regardless of how much money we put into them may not be possible because of the limited space in the soil conditions or otherwise for any form of, uh, of, of improvement. So that still would, would restrict even some of the existing septic systems. Thanks, Russell. There, Director Gree. Thanks, Madam Chair. Well, I spent the better part of yesterday uh, going through the archives as one who lived through a previous incarnation of this project. And uh, it was, it, you know, I sent a few off to uh, Director Arbor, I think, just a little snippets of, you know, little signposts along the way that we may be revisiting as we go down this road again. But uh, I think that the big thing for me is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to go away. And, you know, when you talk about the, the price tag, it's obvious that that price tag should be paid in, in no small part by future uh, uh, residents of the area. So this area is, is a, a growth node and it is slated for considerable population increase. So how do you kick the can down that far so that those people pay their fair share because they're the ones that are gonna benefit the most. Um, another thing I heard of course, uh, in uh, the, the paper, the newspapers were much more raucous in those days. They got away with all kinds of stuff. But one of the things that was clear was that, that we're going to wait for a better deal. Well, I don't know who in their right mind thinks that they get better deals as time goes by. Um, I'm looking at the, the Class D cost estimate from uh, October 2024, and it was hovering around uh, uh, 25 to $27 million. So like my dad would say years ago, there's no cheaper time to build than there is now. And with the, you know, costs increasing like they have been, especially in construction industry, I think it was 27% over the last 18 months. Plus your house value has gone up. So what, what was a $300,000 house then is probably, you know, a $700,000 house now. So I would just, you know, encourage that the, the team here to, to to take the long game on this as much as possible to soften the uh, upfront costs. I don't know how you're going to do that, but uh, it's like I say, it's only going to get more onerous, more expensive, and, and as time goes by, and it's the status quo was not sustainable then, and it's still not sustainable now. We've heard from the shellfish industry that they have situations now where they can't they can't produce the same number of shellfish. Uh, they have the norovirus outbreaks. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it makes so much sense on so many levels to move this forward. So we have to be a little bit adult about it and, um, and, and try to get the heads around the fact that, you know, the total cost compared to your, uh, your cost of your, your house is probably going to be, it's going to be more money, but there again, of course, your value houses is obviously more money than it was um, eight years ago. So 
you know, it, it's unfortunate. We had a, a good a good plan. We had 19 um, million dollars. 50 million came from the gas tax general priorities fund. We had Cumberland was. Um, as far as apportioning uh, uh, the cost, Cumberland was assessed as 62% of the project. And Area A, which includes uh, the Royston uh, Union Bay Harmonic, was 38% of the total. Well, uh, we got the uh, Dear John letter in November 2015 from Cumberland pulling out. Well, that therein lies the rub. And then the, the cost went up exponentially from there. So. We, we don't have that this time. We have the certainty of, of, of uh, the catchment area, what needs to be done. A lot of the, I would think, a lot of the engineering work is still valid. So, you know, it's going to have to happen as, as long as we take a long game on this and it's not going to be, uh, you know, too onerous on the people that are, that are, uh, in, in the in the community right now, because you know they like I say, if you put a new septic system, you should get some slack on that. There should be some some uh, considerations made to bring everybody along over maybe a ten year period or something. I don't know, but we have to uh, keep consulting with with the uh, with the with the residents. I think this is very very good. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about creating a, a technical advisory or, or, a, or a, a citizen advisory on these things, like we did last time, you get a lot of really great ideas from the ground up. So, you know, as we embark on this, pro this project, I, I just think that it's going to have to come to the appropriate outcome this time. Thank you. Thanks, Director Grieve. Um, Director Grieve raises a question around um, financing. So I'm wondering if staff could... Um, maybe answer apart from you know the grant opportunities that we have. How um, how do staff um, consider the costs um, for and the costs and benefits for those who are currently um, needing septic versus future benefit? Um, he mentioned like so much, uh, quite a bit of the the benefit is going to come to future um, development that happens. So how do staff? Um, juggle that in terms of apportioning costs and benefits. I don't know if that if that was a, a, a good way of, of saying it. Thank you very much, Ted Chair and Director Brief. And, and Derry, can you comment on, on that at this time or is some of this analysis yet to come? Yes, certainly these are important questions and questions that the community has been asking as well. So we are working on um, additional analysis to be able to answer them uh, more fully. But I would say, um, you know, as I said in the report, we are working with our project partners um, who are going to be, you know, large landowners and um, responsible for a large part of that new development to provide uh, costs, upfront costs towards the project. And as we will also be borrowing for uh, a share of the project um, as kind of additional residents come online over time, they will also share in the debt servicing costs for that money. Thanks so much, Terry. Any further questions? Dr. Yeah, Arvin. I think so, one more. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a common question. Uh, building on what Director Grieve was saying around um, some of the feedback we got and the report is attached to uh, to this uh, general report. Um, but a, a couple of ideas that I think may be, from my perspective anyways, uh, maybe staff will think different, but that may be worth considering ahead of applying for the grant. Uh, the first one is the one that Director Grieve raised, which is, um, and, and a resident of, of Union Bay really described that to me well as a concept. Um, around those who have recently put in new septic, we have a lot of no votes there, uh, you know, regardless of the cost, because they just made a big investment in it. And it was the same time, same thing at the last uh, referendum. And, and uh, his thought was, you know, is there a way that um, they can start to provide the flow and that they can um, so basically get connected, you know, be charged uh, the yearly uh, cost, but maybe have a deferral on the capital portion. Something to acknowledge that they've done right in the last few years and, and that they've put in that new septic. Um, so 
you know, I, I think there's merit in thinking about solutions for those who have who have recently invested. And when I say recently, that's to be defined, whether it's five years or 10 years or acknowledging that the project won't be ready for probably another four, six years. <laughs> you know, um, it may not be a high number of properties, um, but I, I think it'd be worthwhile to look at that and what that could mean to the financing overall. And the second piece was a... Uh, I forget her name, a lady um, at the Union B Open House, and she was talking about, you know, one of the hassles of transferring is decommissioning the old field. And is there a way that the regional district could help with kind of taking that out of the equation and creating a program for everybody so not everybody's on their own trying to figure this piece out? So basically that we provide a service that's you know, we're going to connect you right into your home. <laughs> you don't have to chase contractors on the sides and maybe there's costs and scale efficiencies and what does it mean for the project? So those were the two things that I thought could be worth thinking about ahead of the, uh, the, the grant deadline. Otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm totally thrilled. I mean, I, I know we say it every meeting, but it, we should say it every meeting. Uh, the partnership with KFN on this was the game changer having access to the municipal system was definitely historical in terms of um, you know not having to consider a plant or some kind of underwater system. Um, so we've made huge progress, but to get it to the finish line, my only hope, whether this comes to pass with the, the, the provincial and federal government and with the residents of Union Bay is that we put the best possible project forward and that everybody, even if they end up not supporting it, can say, you know what, this is actually a good value proposition and, and it has a lot of merit. So that's my intent for the next few months to focus on that and, and no doubt will consume a lot of the rest of the term for area. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Director, and Madam Chair can an answer the question. That's the two ideas that uh, Director Arbor have raised are very good ones, and, and, and there's several others that we made note of that the public came forward with. We won't necessarily resolve those before the grant application. I don't think it will change what the grant asks or the rationale for the grant, but those are questions that we will definitely need to address with the community through the further engagement that we have with them leading up to a referendum so that they know whether we can deliver on those. So we haven't lost sight of it, but we might not come back to you with a plan or your ideas in advance of the grant just because of the limited time. And I'm thinking we really need to be able to come back to the public before the referendum to answer those questions. There go. All right, thank you. Just an extra one, if I could. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned referendum again. I'm wondering if this is a long-term project, if it shouldn't be done under a liquid waste management plan, that would create a, a pack and attack and, uh, and much more public consultation along the way. Um, so just, to, just curious. And the other thing was uh, it alluded to... Uh, the fact that uh, regional districts uh, have the ability as well to uh, create a um, a on-site septic program, which which we've been doing on the education piece already, and it kind of alluded to the fact that if this doesn't go through, then we might instigate that. Well, I would say they have to run in parallel anyway, because my understanding with the shellfish growers is that. Not all the, uh, the pollution comes just from the, uh, the, uh, the denser areas. A lot of it comes from Damon Island itself and Ships Point, Fanny Bay and what have you with failing septics along the foreshore. So I, I don't think it's, you know, it's not a threat. It's not a big stick. It's just common sense that we're going to have to get uh, a handle on, on all wastewater treatment whether it be uh, on-site personal or whether it's something that we do in the public, but it needs to be done. This is 2022 already. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Director and Madam Chair. I'll answer the first question with respect to um, a liquid waste management planning process, and then I'll ask Derry to answer or respond to the second question regarding um, septic um, 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 requirements and, and maintenance. Um, Director Grieve, the, um, one of the things the province has indicated to us is that if this grant is going to be successful, we need to indicate to them there is public assent or public approval uh, for their share of the costs in a timely manner. And basically uh, putting a referendum on the ballot in October would be really the latest possibility for us. 
Um, therefore, unfortunately, we really don't have the time under this grant program to, to qualify for this grant to, to get acceptance and then undertake a liquid waste management planning process. So uh, it's, it's unfortunately not, not an option, but something that we definitely uh, considered uh, uh, in detail whether it would be possible. And then, Derry, if you could respond to the next. Yes, certainly. Thank you through the chair uh, to answer Director Gray's question. Um, we, we certainly will continue on with our um, on-site management program. Our septic education program has been very successful over the last few years and we'll continue on with our, um, with our workshops and, and information available to residents. As well, we are continuing um, to move forward the mandatory maintenance program and the research and work that's needed to be able to implement that in the future. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing and seeing none on receipt, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. And we have a recommendation. Still seconded. Moved and seconded. Thank you. That staff submit an application for grant funding for the South Sewer Extension South project through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Um, on the recommendation. Sorry. A question on the recommendation. Oh, go ahead, please, Director Reeve. Thank you very much. I'm just curious. Uh, we talk about this particular. Uh, uh, um, funding stream is, and it was alluded to that we need to have everything in place by next October. So it, that's, that's pretty scary looming deadline. And, uh, you know, a, a failure at this point, but like you say, would probably make this item uh, dead in the water, dead in the wastewater, so to speak. But my question is, is this basically a reoccurring funding stream? Is there other options available, say, in 2023, 2024? Because I, I think that part of the problem we had last time was we did rush into it after Cumberland pulled out. And I didn't think that was wise. But um, just wondering, I mean, how often are these uh, programs available? Um, Madam Chair, I'll ask Derry to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, this is unfortunately the third and final intake under this particular uh, provincial federal agreement for funding. Uh, that's not to say there won't be future um, funding programs, but nothing that, that we know of on the horizon right now to support this type of infrastructure project. Thanks, Terry. Um, Director Arbor, did I see you had a question? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so it's uh, basically all hands on deck this year. Uh, including the partners, KFN, Union Bay Estates, the residents, ourselves, obviously, um, to try to, obviously it's gonna go in if this motion passes. Um, I'm, I'm quite amenable to think that uh, we could do the necessary work in the next months to consider a ballot question at, uh, at the municipal in October on the sewage issue, if we're able to put together a good proposal. If not, let's not force it. But not unlike, I hate to bring it up first thing in the new year, but not only the garbage and recycling issue, you know, local government can only come back so many times <laughs> to the ratepayers with proposals. This would be the fourth referendum since 1999 on, on sewage in, the, in that area. So, um, and knowing from dairy and staff that there may not be um, opportunities after, you know, let's, let's get it done. Let's try to see if the numbers make sense if the alignment between partners makes sense, I'm hopeful. I think we can do it. And uh, yeah, inshallah. Thanks for that. I don't see any other comments or questions. On the recommendation then, is anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And I believe we have an item under new business. Director Arbor, did you want to? Um... Thank you. Yeah, just a quick uh, request to staff. Uh, what, what do we call those things? Request to staff. Referral. 
request request for action action request that's it i'm losing my language a month away does that uh, request for action which is to which is for staff to get back to the delegation and to the esc uh, with the best attempt to answer the questions. I think there was a comment from the CEO that you may not be able to answer the, the questions, then you can probably just state that as an answer. Uh, but, uh, but the more we can provide transparency around some of those, uh, those questions, I think the better. Thank you. Okay, that's moved. Do we have a seconder? I can second it. Right. Um, and do staff have the wording for that um, that motion? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, just to um, for staff to respond to the delegation to the EASC to answer the questions posed by the delegation. Great, and I think also respond to the delegation itself. Great, thank you. And do directors have any questions or comments on the the motion? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just realized that there was one question that was not in their presentation that they brought up after, and it was very crystal in my mind until about now, and I forgot it. So let's make sure that whatever that question was gets captured as well. I think it had merit as well. I, I just, I don't know if anyone recalls it, but I know they had an extra one right after. Oh, uh, yes, no, Chair, I, I made note of it, and that was with respect to the uh, attendance and purpose of a meeting held in January on site. Correct. Thanks, that staff around it. Director Grief. Just one more thing, and that's that uh, we have in the report as well um, some reference to whatever permits or uh, or conditions or licenses that uh, that the uh, the operator is paying to government, and find out where the money is going. Thank you. I think too much of the staff's ability, I think they'll attempt that. Um, any other comments? Hearing and seeing none uh, on that motion of uh, re requested action, is anyone opposed? And that is carried. Right. And we, I believe we have a motion to move in camera under 91F. So well, move with a break. Yes, definitely. We'll move that in the first and, and pass it and then we'll have a break. So that's 91F law enforcement. If the committee board considers this disclosure could be reasonably be expected to harm the conduct of an investigation under or enforcement of enactment. So moved and I can second and comments or questions on that in camera recommendation. Hearing and seeing none, is anyone opposed? and that is carried.